Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Business Law Podcast Series. I'm your professor, Glenn Torres Spellacy. Thanks for joining me. In the last lecture, we reviewed the various regimes which regulate trade, whether it's trade in good or services. In this section, we're going to begin to look at the mechanics of trade by examining how sales are regulated under international law and how goods that have been sold are transported between buyers and sellers, and finally, who bears the risk of that transport. As I have repeatedly stressed throughout these lectures, in all transactions, but particularly international transactions, where the parties operate in different legal regimes in different countries. What the law is trying to do through regulation is establish reliable expectations so that individuals involved in transactions have enough of a sense of security to proceed. In short, the law seeks to mitigate the risk of doing business internationally. It seeks to create common, legally enforceable understandings among trading partners and thereby reduce the risk associated with international trade. Now, the primary international law regulating the sale of goods across borders is the UN Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, commonly called the CISG. It was adopted in 1980. The purpose of the CISG is to provide a comprehensive set of uniform rules to be applied by all member states and which contracting parties can rely on as binding. As of 2020, 94 states are members. Although some significant participants in the international trading market have only recently just joined. For example, Brazil joined in April 2014, they're the 23rd largest export exporter in the world. Uh, Japan joined in 2009, Japan's the 6th largest exporter in the world. Still, there are some significant players in the international trade market that have yet to adopt the CISG, including the United Kingdom, the world's fifth largest exporter, and India, currently the 19th largest exporter but projected to be the second largest trading nation by 2050, with a projected 8.4% of all trade by that time. Now, the CISG applies to all contracts involving the sale of goods in a certain circumstances. First, the buyer and seller must be based in different states, and, and either 1. Both of those states must be treaty members, 2. The contract that is being signed applies the law of a member state, provided that the states haven't limited its application to only those instances where both states are members, or 3. The contract for sale between the parties calls explicitly for the application of the CISG. Similarly, the parties can choose to have the CISG not apply, even if it normally would. Now, the second point I have set up there is rather complicated, but it's important, so let me break it down with a little more detail and through an example. Let's say we start with two business people, one from the United States and the other, Germany. Does the CISG apply? Well, we know that both states, the United States and Germany, are members of the CISG, so yes it would apply. But now let's change our facts just a little. Let's say that instead of being from Germany, our trading partner is from the United Kingdom. Now, as I said above, the United Kingdom is not a member of the CISG. But the treaty could still apply. See, it depends on what the contract says and what the state law says. If the contract says that British law applies, then it's easy. Because Britain is not a member of the CISG, the treaty doesn't apply. If, however, the contract says that U.S. law applies, because the U.S. is a member, the treaty could apply here, and could is a key word. What does it depend on? Well, as with all treaties, we have to look to what the states actually agreed to when they signed the treaty. And what we find is that when the United States signed the treaty, they entered a reservation saying that under U.S. law, both countries must be members for the CISG to apply. So the CISG would not apply in this sale, or in any sale between a US resident and the resident of a non-member state. Now finally, let's tweak our scenario one more time. Instead of having the individual be from the United States, let's say they are from Canada. 
So now we have a deal between someone from Canada and someone from the UK. Canada is a member of the CISG and again the UK is not. If the contract says that Canadian, Canadian law applies, then we look to the Canadian ratification of the treaty. Now importantly here, there is no Canadian law requiring both home countries to be members of the CISG. As a result, the CISG would apply here. As you can see, sometimes figuring out whether the law applies or not can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, importantly, the convention doesn't seek to regulate all aspects of the contract with many of the most important issues being left to domestic regulations and the agreement of the parties. The CISG only seeks to establish uniformity across systems with respect to issues of contract formation and available remedies. As a result, it excludes questions about legality, competency, third-party rights, and certain issues of liability for personal injuries. These questions are all left to be dealt with by domestic law regulating the contract. That's a crucial issue because where the CISG does apply, it trumps domestic law. As for the substantive parts of the law on contract formation and breach, the CISG provisions largely mirror the provisions of U.S. domestic contract law, so I will leave you to read about them in your book. Now, after you buy or sell goods, the next critical phase is obviously the transfer of the goods between the buyer and the seller. In international trade, that distance is often quite substantial and transportation can be risky. Anytime you're moving a good from point A to point B, you run the risk of damage or loss. Because of these risks, a series of laws and regulations have developed to assign responsibility for the risks and to create common understandings in the industry as to the meaning of certain terms. These are known as trade terms. The terms can be defined by the parties themselves or they can be based on a set of predetermined rules, like the INCO terms adopted by the US Chamber of Commerce. Trade terms are generally divided into general groups identified by letters and are used to define a number of standard terms in the contract, such as the time and place where the buyer is to take delivery and pay for the goods, the price of the goods, the cost of freight and insurance, and importantly, when the risk of transportation shifts between the party. You see, when the risk shifts between the parties is crucial, because this is a period of time where neither party is in possession or control of the goods. The goods are in transport. As a result, who bears the risk of loss is not immediately apparent, and therefore must be spelled out in the contract. The primary means of shipping is actually by sea, and there are a variety of rules and regulations that have developed to regulate this type of trade. Uh, there are many different ways to ship goods by sea, including common carriers, charter parties, and more. Uh, the primary document involved in the shipping by sea is called a Bill of Laden, which governs the rights and responsibilities of the parties to the process. Uh, the Bill of Laden also serves as title to the goods, and the buyer needs it to claim his merchandise. Well, that's it for this week's short podcast. Next week, we'll move on to a discussion of how to finance trade in the international marketplace. Go on to do the readings for this week, and I will see you on the discussion boards. Mm -hmm.